Hi everybody, welcome back to Earned Happy Endings. I'm your host Lily Holman and this is week 12 of 13 in the Manic Pixar Dream Girl series. That's right, we're it's the penultimate episode um, and it is actually the last week we're going to talk about a short itself. Next week we're going to talk a little bit about the features. So, and conclude. Um, but before we get to this week's content, I want to issue a correction and an apology. Um, I made one mistake and kept repeating it. Um, so I referred to Dr. Wayne Dyer's speech in Day and Night, but I accidentally called him Dr. Wayne Dreyer and kept doing so. I am incredibly sorry about this, not only because he is because of his um, wonderful contribution to the short, um, but he actually passed away today. And so, and to honor his memory um, and honor his contributions, I want to say that was Dr. Wayne Dyer's speech and apologize for my own carelessness. So, but let's celebrate him by celebrating the new and talk about the Blue Umbrella, because I am so incredibly excited to talk to you about the Blue Umbrella. I know it probably seems like just another short, but once you sit down and look at it, it's just a fountain of interesting analysis, and says a lot of interesting things about animation and Pixar and film itself. Um, and I know you think I'm probably exaggerating right now, but I'm really not. So. I hope you did your homework and read Professor Scott Higgins' piece on the Blue Umbrella. Um, I worked very closely, closely with him while I was writing this. He was my thesis advisor. Um, and he talks really beautifully about this short as a whole, but especially about um, the final moment where the colors intercede and that it was actually an accident and what that means for film as a whole and its forward momentum. It's an excellent piece. I'm going to focus on similar issues, but a little bit less on that one moment. But the one thing I, from that piece, the one quote that I want you to take with it and think about in terms of our analysis for today is um, when Higgins says that in its realism, the blue umbrella erases the boundary between art and representation. And we're going to talk a lot about that. So let's jump right in. Um, and get talking because it's cool. Also, look, I'm actually wearing a Blue Umbrella shirt. Um, they're rare, and I'm very proud of it. So, cool. Anyways, so the Blue Umbrella came out in 2013 in front of Monsters University. Um, and it's Pixar's most distinctive technical undertaking since day and night. And it attempts an actually controversial photorealist look where the animation looks so real that it appears as live action. I don't know if you had what I had the first time I watched it. The first time I watched it, I was actually convinced the opening shots were live action. And it had superimposed animation on top of it. That is wrong. It is completely and utterly animated. There is no, no live action there. So let's talk about what that means. Um, so I had the great honor and fabulous opportunity to talk to day and night director Teddy Newton um, while I was doing research for this project. Um, and while we were talking, he actually mentioned how the photorealism is a controversial method because in some people's eyes, it removes the imaginative purpose behind animation in the first place. So what I, I think there's a valid concern and a very... Um, and the filmmakers who have that, um, I understand where they're coming from. But what I'm going to argue is that it actually serves to highlight the best parts of animation and talk about why it actually um, exemplifies why we do animation in the first place. So the magic behind Blue Umbrella is that it uses many of the strategies that have made Pixar successful in the traditional animated field I can't believe I'm referring to it as traditional. The computer animated field, revolutionize it, make it establish a tradition, and then play with that tradition. So everything they did before this, they still use in the blue umbrella. This is not a different form. It's just a different look. Um, and so by doing so, it proves that animation is less rooted um, in look, but rather in content. And how the most emotionally resonant fantasies are actually rooted in reality. 
So think about that a little bit. It, imagination, like, it's why fantasy novels, like, I keep referring to fantasy novels, but they're a really good example. It's why they work, because they take this idea that it could be happening just behind the curtain. Um, and all it takes is an imaginative artist to look at something real and come up with something imaginative behind it. And so this is what the Blue Umbrella is proving, because they're going to take something that looks real and then totally play with the idea and put the impossible on screen. Um, and by Rooney in the real, they actually make it m far more approachable to us. So we watch it and we see our world in front of us at the same time. And so we can believe in it and um, superimpose our emotions upon it. And then it can take us to new and different places. I hope that kind of clarifies. Um, and so ultimately, ultimately, it is the quintessential Pixar hybrid piece because it uses all the lessons Pixar has learned so far as a company of artists to prove a grander point about animation status as a cinematic art form. So that's very grandiose, but I promise you it is, it, I will prove it. So... Realism, in quotes, the term, has been a divisive concept in cinema from the very beginning of its history. Um, film critic V.F. Perkins, who wrote the book Film on Film, explains how orthodox theorists felt that film cannot be art, for it does nothing but reproduce reality mechanically. End quote. The theorists had yet to understand the theorists he refers to have yet had yet to understand the power the filmmaker has in choosing the reality he or she desires to reproduce. Um, the theorists saw the filmmakers as technicians more than artists, and because of that, they didn't see their expressive power. So Perkins goes on to quote film film historian Paul Rotha, who quote ventured to predict that the film would be able to reach the heights of the other arts only when it frees itself from the bonds of photographic reproduction and becomes a pure work of man, namely as animated cartoon or painting, end quote. So Rotha's statement puts the blue umbrella in a very unique position. Um, Rotha did not an anticipate what would happen when the completely man-made animated cartoon advanced far enough technologically to actually reproduce reality. He d he always kept them on opposing sides. He did, however, anticipate the problems that Teddy Newton referred to almost a half century later. So, the critics of this photorealist method do not understand why a medium, where part of the appeal is that the entire world it presents comes from the imagination of an artist, would opt to try and reproduce reality so closely. Um... So the theory Perkins provides to counter those doubts is that, quote, there's going to be a lot more quotes in this section, and I don't apologize. They're great quotes, um, but I do apologize for the constant quote, unquote, quote, unquote, you know. Um, it's not as flowy. So <laughs> is Perkins, quote, um, the movie offers two forms of magic. Um, the first on which the realist theory concentrates gives it the power to possess the real world by capturing its appearance. The second focus of the traditional aesthetic permits the presentation of an ideal image ordered by the filmmaker's will and imagination. End quote. While he was not referring specifically to animation, Perkins' second form of magic exemplifies exactly what makes animation so special. It is that complete control that the artist has and Rotha alludes to in his quote. What Perkins does, though, is show that realism does not mean the hand of the artist is missing. In fact, by using a realistic look to produce an environment familiar to the audience, the film makes it easier to believe in the parts of the image rooted in the will and the imagination. Since the building blocks the animators are using are modeled after a real-life city, when they start manipulating them to be magical, it is more surprising, but ultimately more enchanting. So the film viewer could go outside after the film and start seeing the faces that the filmmakers present to them and imagine them moving right before their back, right behind their backs. So it's like the concept of Toy Story. It's like, as soon as Andy comes in, they flop and go back to being lifeless, but when he's gone, they have their own little society. It's, it's a, the it's, um, 
a concept that you find in almost all Pixar films and is really brought to light here. So what the Blue Umbrella really is, is the ideal view of the real world as seen through the imagination of the artists who created it. So I'm going to stop there and let you think about all of that um, big theory stuff, and then we're going to come back and talk about the actual film. But it's a lot of theory, um, but um, take your time, think about it, think about what it means, um, think about what it means in terms of film history, think about how you saw it versus how you've watched other things, think about reality, I don't know, think and come back and then we'll talk about those adorable, adorable umbrellas. Cool.